Affiliation. Okay, great. Simmons is a, has a program that's a graduate school of management. It has short-term programs for building women executives and managers. And I happen to be an alum of the program, and so I've been looking for ways since I got to the Kennedy School that we could share events together and share the networks. How many people are here through the network of the Boston Network for Women in Politics and Government? Great. When uh, Linda Wolfson from Simmons and I were working on a project for Simmons, we started looking for someone who could write an article for uh, one of the publications, and in fact it was Elizabeth Sherman from the Boston Network who said, I'll write a, uh, an article on uh, women in politics and government. So we've been working together and looking for a way that we could uh, sponsor some kind of an event together. The uh, Boston Network is a social and educational association for women who are interested in government and public policy and it promotes informal and knowledgeable participation by women in government. They have about six different meetings a year looking for a way to promote women in, public, in the public sector and in elective office. So we have several representatives from the uh, network tonight. The Institute of Politics is kind of the founding group of this uh, event in that uh, the Institute of Politics is part of Harvard and it was established to further student interest in the dynamics of politics and to increase understanding and cooperation between the scholarly community and the political world. And we're very grateful tonight that they could put together the uh, event for us and support us in having it. Let me just say a, a word about uh, the Kennedy School. How many people are affiliated with Kennedy School? Great, thanks for being here. We have also a number of programs, from executive programs that are short programs for people at all levels of government. We have pre-career programs that are two-year master's programs, and we also have a mid-career master's for people with or who are already professionals in the public sector and who come here for another year to get a master's degree and to add to their learning and to go on into the world when they complete it. So tonight comes out of a commitment that was made a couple of years ago to promote women in government. And the Kennedy School sponsored a program to build women leaders. And part of it is a fellowship, which is a natural thing for a school to have. But the other part of it was to say, what else do we need at the Kennedy School that would show the promotion of women in government and leadership positions? And we realized that what was sorely missing was women who come and are in forum events and who are the role models for us to follow and to look at the way they've gone and to follow behind them. So when I came to the Kennedy School, one of my commitments was to look at more ways to bring women into, into the forum for that purpose. So I'm very pleased tonight to be able to bring this group together and to have this event for that reason. So that's the advertising for the evening. And what I'd like to do now is introduce Elizabeth Cook McCabe, who's our moderator for the evening. She's woven together a career of work in both the public sector and the private sector, from directing, directing cultural affairs for the city of Boston, coordinating community and public affairs for the Boston Public Schools, to now being the executive director of the Advertising Club of Greater Boston. Her professional roles have also interwoven with her personal interest in contributing to social issues. She's a member of Business Executives for National Security, and she's active in Beyond War. She's recently returned from a trip to Israel, where she and other non-Jewish leaders visited to be immersed in the cultures in Israel to gain a deeper understanding of the country's development and how the people from varying countries live side by side, and to examine what works and, and, in the, and what are the conflicts that need to be remedied. So it's with great honor that I introduce to you Elizabeth Cook McCabe. I also might add I'm a graduate of the Simmons Network, and uh, so on many reasons I'm very happy to be here. So welcome to Women for Peace and to Women for America and Women for the World. And it's a real salute, I think, to the five different groups that are, have come together tonight and representative of the fact that we are all in this together and cooperative joint efforts is what it's all about. I want to just tell you how the evening will proceed so you'll know what you're in for. Uh, in just a few minutes, we'll show the film. And the film, uh, Women for America, Women for the World, was a 1987 Academy Award winning film. It's about a half an hour. Um, I think you'll be very inspired by it. One of our panelists is in the film, uh, Mary Dent Crisp, so you might take special note of that. 
Then after the film, we'll give you a few minutes to talk to each other because it's a very powerful uh, time and it's a chance for you to have something to say. And then each of the panelists will speak for about five, eight, ten minutes at most about their own personal experiences, their own commitment to peace, and the results that have shown up in their life as a result of their work. Uh, we will then give you a chance, because uh, we're all stars here together, to talk about something that's happened in your life, something that you're committed to, results you've produced, or questions you might have from the panelists. Um, and then we'll close the evening about 9.30. So your job here tonight, if there is one, is to really observe the film and listen and allow yourself to be inspired. The purpose that we had as we put together tonight's evening was to really give you a chance to um, have some time to think and to see that individuals can make a difference. When Sue wrote the letter to the panelists, she had a quote from Margaret Mead uh, speaking a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. So for those of you who have taken time out of your very busy and overwhelmed lives that we all have to be here tonight, very ripe to be inspired. Um, so thank you for being here, and we'll show the film, and then we'll be on with the panel. Okay, if you just finish that sentence and we'll start with the panel in a moment. Thank you. Um, I will introduce the panelists one by one. Um, so, um, and then they will speak and we'll introduce the next person. So to my left, Beverly Droz, who is the president of WAND. Since 1981, Beverly Droz has been involved with Women's Action for Nuclear Disarmament, a national organization engaging concerned citizens, particularly women, to play an active role in U.S. policy decisions for a world free from the threat of nuclear war. She was the co-founder and served for six years as president of Newton Action for Nuclear Disarmament, a local associate of WAND, which grew during her leadership to one of the most effective grassroots groups in Massachusetts. During her time with WAND and NAND, Ms. Droz has been involved in grassroots lobbying, legislative action, affiliate development, speaker training, community outreach, strategic planning, media work, fundraising, political campaign, electoral work, organizational management. As president of WAN since the fall of 87, Ms. Droz has played a major role in leading the organization through transition and strategic planning for the 88 elections and beyond. A strong believer of women taking responsibility for having a voice in issues that affect the future of our children, our environment, and our planet, Ms. Droz has traveled from California to Moscow in her work to potentiate women's voice in these issues of life and death. Beverly, thank you for being here tonight. Um, is this mic okay? Can everyone hear all right? Well, I thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. I've seen that film probably about five or six times, and it never ceases to move me. Just, just the power of many women, especially, certainly many men involved, but many women finding their voice and, and really taking a leadership role something that's very much needed not only in our country but around the world and tonight each of us is going to talk a little bit about how we personally got involved and also a little bit about our organization and maybe some degree of where we see things going so I guess I would start on that note except I think one more thing I'd like to mention with the film um, I was very moved by Alyssa Malamud and she worked with WAND in years past, especially around 1984, and she's since died. So we've lost a very special woman and friend. Um, but that is, of course, part of what faces all of us, either in growing old for a natural death or looking at where we're going with nuclear weapons, nuclear power, and the destruction of the environment. So whereas we've been taught that death is not a pleasant subject to talk about, it is in ra reality facing us uh, in many different aspects of our future. 
Um, I'll take just a very brief mo moment to let you get to know me a little bit, and I think that I don't want to dwell on myself because I think every single one of us is very special. And if we happen to begin to get a leadership role in what we're doing, that's wonderful. But it takes all of us working together to bring about the change that's really needed. I first became personally involved in the particular issue of nuclear disarmament back early in 1981 when I heard Dr. Helen Caldicott speak in Newton, which of course is local here to the greater Boston area. And like many other people, I was very, very moved by what she had to say, but mostly that she kind of really put it out there in terms of each of us taking responsibility, that it's not just her or some other good speaker up there talking about the arms race or our future or our survival as people, but rather that this is a democracy and we each have to play a role, even if it's a small role, that we each have to take a part in that. At the time, I was a single parent raising two little children, and my, my priority, as was mentioned uh, in that film there, was you know making sure my kids got their dental checkups or their doctor's checkups or looking into their education or their child care or even earning the money to support them. And all of a sudden, it became a reality that very day in hearing Helen Caldicott speak about our responsibility that everything that I was doing was certainly to the benefit of my children, but it wasn't going to matter given the fact of the race that we were on in the competition of the arms race with the Soviet Union and also um, the exploitation of nuclear weapons around the world as well as many interrelated issues. So I immediately did become involved and you know each of us all goes through a process of dealing with oh, depression, anger, all sorts of emotions and it's really true. I mean as women I've run in as a woman I've run into a lot of men in my quest to make our organization move forward to be a vehicle for action for people and I had a lot of questions from men in terms of well you're too emotional and it's really true if you can't feel some emotion about the death of the planet, the death of our species, the death of the music of Mozart, of Beethoven, the death of the art that has been perpetuated through history, then what can you feel emotional about? And so we have to remember that in terms of our intuition and our gut level, that we don't have to know the exact numbers of, of the weapon systems, but the very fact that we want the planet to survive. We want there to be goodwill among human beings and every species that exists on the planet. And WAND, which is Women's Action for Nuclear Disarmament, was founded by Helen Caldicott, and it was done so in her response to the women as she gave speeches. She was very connected, she was a physician, and um, at the time, president of Physicians for Social Responsibility. So as she gave speeches, though, she found out afterwards it was the women who, in particular, came up to her and said, but what can I do as a housewife, as a working woman, as a mother, as a student? What, what can I do? I'm not used to working in these issues. What can I do to make a difference? And that's, part of, that's the majority of the reason that WAND was founded. Um, WAND is a kind of a co complex but very interesting organization. We have, of course, an education fund which deals with programmatic and education programs to help the public in their awareness of the issues. And we have a membership organization which puts us in the political realm of being able to legally do work, political work around the country. From that, we also have an arm, Political Action Committee, one PAC, which can work directly in the election. So it's kind of a three-pronged organization. And it started then, and it has built and has grown across the country with affiliate groups, people such as myself or yourself, just really wanting to be involved in basic democratic ways to change what's happening to our government, knowing that if we can really work within our own system, sometimes if you get the whole global perspective of everything that's happening around the world, it's somewhat overwhelming, but, and you may not be able to travel all over the place, but if you can work in your own area to make a difference, it really helps, and you are making a difference. So we have 
set up affiliate groups in at least 35 states across the country and the major membership population of WAND is women but certainly we encourage men and women to be active in our work to change U.S. policies and to stop the arms race in particular. During the past seven years of WAND's work we've grown a lot in terms of opening an office down in Washington D.C. and doing some actual lobbying and putting out the legislative alerts which then go to different affiliate groups or individuals in other parts of the country so that they can talk to their representatives and get them to perhaps change their vote by way of the constituency educating these congressional people, senators, on the issues and there has been much success and it doesn't come just from one. There's many groups like that that are working but it's it's very important to see more and more women taking a leadership role. We encourage women to start by getting educated to politics, to get educated and to begin to run for local offices and then statewide offices and eventually U.S. you know, national offices. And hopefully someday I think we'll all feel a lot better, at least I will, when we have a lot more leadership by women truly represented around the country. I think that when we look at women in particular, you know, we have to realize in our country that two out of every three poor adults in our country are women. We have to know that 80% of the poor in the United States are adult women and children. We have to know that 75% of the elderly poor are women. And no matter how much you cut it, the research proves that the military spending, the military priorities of this government are continuing to lead us into an economic decline because you can't have it both ways. You can't burn your candle at both ends. If you don't feed the children, if you don't educate them, like the film showed, every nutritional and educational program since 1981 for children has been cut. And the children, we always say, are the future of our society. And yet we continue to take this money and put it to more and more of the arms race. How much of the arms race can we have? We have every city in the United States of 25,000 is targeted. Well, Newton's a community of 80,000 people, so, and being near the nuclear power plants, and of course any nuclear power plants and military installations are targeted. Um, so most of us are all targeted. What does the Pentagon consider to be acceptable? They accept 20 million of us dying in a nuclear war. It's written down in their papers. Now, a lot of people um, feel that, you know, it's not just where, the, where the, the gloom and doom of the figures come in. It's how we can make a change and that's the main message that there's a lot of hope out there. It's like pebbles in a pond. It's really rippling and everything that we do to make a change is going to affect other people and it's going to grow and grow and I think we're seeing that across the country now. You can help each one of you by doing things such as contacting your congresspeople, by joining a group. None of us are alone. It doesn't mean you have to join one, but you can join a group and be a part of the constituency and the power that goes down to the United States congressional people and says, we represent X amount of people out there and you've got to listen. We want change. We can make that happen and we're going to hear a lot more about it tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist is Susan Coos. Susan is the New England Regional Coordinator of Business Executives for National Security. She's self-employed and she manages real estate and stock market investments. She has a long history, 30 years of volunteer activity in many areas and in many parts of the world. Um, she's very active in Orange County in the Mental Health Association. She was a member of the University of California at Irvine Foundation Board. Uh, she lived for a time in Mexico City and taught at the Harvard Business School program there. Was active in the Girl Scouts of America as well as the Girl Scouts in Mexico. She has been a part of the California State Democratic Committee and uh, chairman of the Justice Committee of Orange County. So I'd like to introduce to you Susan Coos. Thank you. 
Uh, well, when Sue Williamson very graciously invited me to be on this panel, she was somewhat emphatic about suggesting that I just say a few words about my background. And uh, she again nudged me a little on that, and that reminded me of a story that a judge, a friend of mine from my home state of Minnesota, told me about <laughs> one Friday evening he and his wife were entertaining at dinner, and the housekeeper came to the dining room and said that there were was a young couple at the door. They appeared to be somewhat, uh, seemed to be an urgent matter, and would he mind coming and talking with them? And he said no, so he went to the door of his home, and there indeed were a young rural couple from a community next door to his, and he said, how can I help you? And they said, well, we want you to marry us right now. It's just really important. And he said, well, I'm delighted to see how happy you are and how eager you are to be married. But, you know, it's uh, fr Friday night, and we have these rules and regulations in Minnesota. But if you'll come into my office on Monday morning, uh, you know, we'll get the papers signed, and I'll be delighted to marry you. Whereupon the young woman said, well, well, Your Honor, I mean, could you just say a few words to take us through the weekend? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, just saying a few words I have to share with you is not how I grew up in Minnesota. And I grew up there on the banks of the Mississippi River, in what the rest of the world now knows as Lake Wobegon because of Garrison Keillor's explanations. Uh, it actually is Anoka, Minnesota. And I saw a book in the store the other day entitled How to Talk Minnesota, A Visitor's Guide. Uh, well, I'd have to say that you didn't need a visitor's guide to talk at our family Sunday uh, dinner table. My father was a small town doctor, a general practitioner, and treated some four generations of families in our county and while he was treating them, he was indoctrinating them in the values of being good Republicans. I must share with you that despite the size of his practice, the county continually voted the Democratic farmer labor ticket. <laughs> However, in our home at the Sunday dinner, you learned to denounce the New Deal, thereby getting a good deal, which there was a little less tension at the dinner table, and if you really behaved, you got seconds on your just desserts. So. I managed to maintain my Republican indoctrination uh, at the University of Minnesota despite having political science as one of my majors and spending hours in the class of such liberal professors as Mumford Sibley, Werner Levy, and Saw Bellow. I, worked, I even worked for a time after I graduated as an executive assistant to the Re Republican state co-chairs. Change came. I married Arthur Cuse, an Easterner who had grown up in New York City and was educated at Caltech and the Harvard Business School and was running a small manufacturing company in Mexico City. Moving there right after our wedding was another big change. Life as an American in Mexico City for some four years gave me what I thought was some much needed insight into our American foreign policy and how it worked in another country. I remember at the beginning how surprised I was to learn that the Russians had the largest embassy in the world in Mexico City and that the Americans had the largest number of consulates in Mexico of any country in the world. And there was a story going around in those days that the CIA, people who had retired from the CIA in Mexico, were going to have a little dinner party down at the University Club on Avenida Reforma. Well, so many people showed up they couldn't seat them all. I also learned what it was to be a second-class citizen. The enclave of the Anglo-American community in Mexico at that time was some 12 to 14,000 people in a population of about 7 million. The first social event I attended was a luncheon at a women's club. They were celebrating George Washington's birthday, and the guest speaker spoke for more than an hour and held the audience in rapt attention. I must say that because the only thing I understood was an intermittent shout of Vive Jorge Washington, I was inspired to learn Spanish. <laughs> but my second class citizenship implied more than just a small group of American citizens living in a country as full-time residents. It permeated what you could say and what you could do. I found that in volunteer work, you could not start a program to help distribute food to the needy. You could tour a government hospital and see five-year-old children the size of six-month-old babies for malnutrition, but the government policies would not allow us to set up a foreign food distribution network in Mexico. However, the Mexican government cooperated with and benefited enormously from uh, working with the Rockefeller Agricultural Foundation in soil and crop management. In fact, Norman Borlaug won his Nobel Prize for the work that he did in Mexico in crop development in northern Mexico. 
I learned that our cultural differences were vast and that the Mexicans were easily intimidated by enterprising Americans, whether socially or economically. Their historical view of us was not favorable. I particularly experienced that when I was elected to play a principal role in the merger of the American Girl Scouts in Mexico with the Niñas Guías, the Mexican guiding program. The merger had been mandated by the World Guiding Association in Geneva, which is the umbrella organization for Girl Scouts and guiding throughout the world. The fallout of the mandate was significant. The Americans residing in Mexico were required under the McCarran Act to maintain their children's citizenship by proving that they raised their children in an American way on foreign soil. Scouting seemed the perfect way. Years of effort and fundraising had allowed the Americans to accumulate tents, some land, and a lot of equipment. The guiding program, unfortunately, had not been as well attended or funded. The Americans were reluctant to give up not only their financial investment, but more importantly, their means of being an American on foreign soil for their children including their participation in a small Fourth of July celebration. The negotiations were lengthy and difficult. The Americans wanted a program that phased them out or into the guides over a period of time with some ongoing control of their, of their investments. The Mexicans wanted the merger now and they wanted total control of the assets. The impasse was resolved rather quickly and negotiations terminated in one final memorable meeting. <clears throat> the Mexican lady leader told me, the American leader, that she found the position that I was presenting unacceptable and inquired whether or not I was personally familiar with Article 33 of the Mexican Constitution. I was. Article 33 states that any Mexican citizen has the right to denounce a foreigner and request their removal from the country within 24 hours if they find that foreigner's conduct to be incompatible with Mexico. It was the method that had been used to send the screenwriters and others back to the United States who had fled to Mexico during the McCarthy era of persecution. I remained, however, despite this experience, absolutely enamored of Mexico. I suffered from what one writer described as ailment of having the dust of Mexico in your soul and it never leaves you. I continued to work hard for social programs that were acceptable. I taught culture shock at the Harvard Iman program and I took stock of what had been gifted to me as an American citizen growing up in, in America. Many of my experiences reinforced my belief that America's beginnings had been strengthened by a commitment to a social agenda for its people. We created an infrastructure that expressed our reliance on an ethical and moral value system. Volunteerism was part of the glue that kept that infrastructure in place. So returning to the United States with my husband's and my husband's role as a visiting consultant to the faculty at the business school brought me new challenges. We lived here during the two-year period surrounding Jack Kennedy's election. I learned that the Democratic Party was the party with a social agenda for the Republic. When we moved to Southern California, I became for a time a very active member of the Democratic Party, even served as a member of the State Central Committee. I continued my role as a community volunteer, unfortunately divorced, raised my two sons and educated them, and as time ensued, realized that I was bipartisan and bi-coastal, which brought me back to Boston. It has been some four years ago since I came here and I met Ben's. That's Business Executives for National Security. I was working with Sally Cabot Sedgwick on a project to show the Robert Osborne drawings called On Conflict at the Carpenter Center. One of the committee members was a man named Alan Kay, who had been a founder of Ben's in Boston. He explained the organization's goals to me and his program and asked me if I would help facilitate the senatorial debate that Ben's was co-sponsoring between John Kerry and Ray Shamey. I have been involved with Ben's ever since. I am committed because I see this national bipartisan organization of some 4,000 professionals, entrepreneurs, and business executives is a force that has something to say and the resources with which to say it. Ben says we need to redefine national security. We have a federal government that spends 7% of its gross national product on defense, but more importantly, uses one-third of the share of our skilled innovators, one-third of our R&D funding, and one-third of our advanced production facilities on the military. This neglects people's needs and provides little real security. We need to manage our defense for better results. Our national security does not rest with our ability to build new 
and better nuclear weapons. We all know we have enough of those. But I think we do need to remember that no matter how successful we are in controlling the superpowers' nuclear arsenals, we are still open to a nuclear terrorist attack. We must prevent the use of one nuclear weapon. Now, Benz is asking the tough question of how we can prevent the use of one nuclear weapon. We are suggesting that we need to tighten security, make it harder for a terrorist to steal a bomb, make it harder for them to build a bomb, and also make it harder for them to inherit nuclear weapons from an unstable government that might fall victim to revolution. We must stop the spread of nuclear weapons and not just talk about it. We should dedicate our military intelligence to watching out for the spread of nuclear materials which could fall into the hands of terrorists. But terrorists and controlling them is just one facet of our national security. Our national security should rest upon our ability to provide jobs, housing, and education. We need to build economic security in order to do that. I think we have to stop diverting our real economic resources, our capital, and our labor. And we also need to build the psychological and moral resources of this country. Let me just share this with you for a minute. There was a report to Congress on the activities of the operation of the public integrity sector for 1986 from the United States Department of Justice. In 1975, 53 federal officials were indicted. In 1985, 563 federal officials were indicted. In 1975, 43 federal officials were convicted. In 1985, 470 federal officials were convicted. In 1975, five bad guys were awaiting trial. In 1985, 90 were awaiting trial. We need to address these and the other issues that give us daily culture shock and I used to teach that course, remember? Here in America, AIDS, homelessness, drug abuse, open gang warfare on our streets, immigrant problems. I think we need a very vital five-year business plan for this country that has as a part of it a social policy agenda. We need to begin to invest in our country. Paul Kennedy, uh, and I think if we don't do this, we'll lose our world leadership, and Paul Kennedy, the Yale historian, pointed out in his recent publication, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, this very same lesson of history. We need both economic and military security if we are to avoid the decline that other great nations have suffered. Now, I think we need to reevaluate our policies, particularly in regard to our neighbors in Latin America. What about Mexico? What is our plan to deal with their population explosion? immigration problems, drugs, economic crises. I think they represent the pot problems of most of the third world countries. What's our plan? I think Benz is asking those tough questions. I believe that the business community is unique in that it has the power and the persuasion that comes from that power. I think they can turn the country around. They have, as I said before, something to say and the resources with which to say it. It is hopefully not too trite to conclude that nuclear war is bad for business. Thank you, Susan. Some powerful numbers there. I'd like a copy of those. Um, our next panelist, Mary Crisp, whose dramatic break with the Republican Party in 1980 catapulted her to national fame, remains one of our national political leaders as she continues to brighten forums across the country with her wisdom, insight, and inspiration. Twenty years of service to the Republican Party was highlighted by her election as co-chair of the party, but she resigned in 1980 because, as she said, the party reneged on a 40-year commitment to the Equal Rights Amendment. Mary Crisp is currently in the vanguard of those seeking to promote genuine national security and world peace, women's rights, family planning, and civic activism. She is a constant source of encouragement and support to women and men and an inspiration to audiences urging all to get involved in the political process, to register, to be informed, and to vote. Mary Crisp serves today as a senior advisor to business executives for national security, Benz, a nonpartisan trade association of business executives, corporations, entrepreneurs, self employed professionals who are concerned about national security issues. Mary? Thanks. For me, politics is power. 
It's an honorable profession, and it's an addicting profession, and I'm still addicted to the fascinating world of politics. I have an ongoing and deep commitment to my country. I devoted over 20 years to the Republican Party, three and a half years as co-chairman in Washington, and 16 and a half years as a grassroots politician in my then home state of Arizona. For me, my party was a vehicle to serve my country. It was a way to get better government and to hopefully make things better. But looking back, I believe that my first interest in politics took place in the year of 1960, and I read a book called The Capitalist Manifesto by Dr. Adler and Kelso. And the theme of that book was, if you want to make a difference in your own life, the life of your community, you get involved in politics and government because it affects every aspect of your life from the cradle to the grave. So it, the year was 1961, and as a young housewife and mother, I walked into a Republican headquarters in Arizona, and I volunteered. And if someone had told me that day that 16 years later, I would hold the number two position in the Republican Party in this country, I would have said absolute madness. And if someone had also told me that day that in the year 1980, I would be in a political power struggle with the presidential candidate, again, I would have said madness. Well, I worked at every level in the party organization. I was a deputy registrar, a block worker, a precinct committee woman, precinct captain, a legislative district chair, vice chair uh, of the county and vice chair of the state committee. You notice I always say vice chair. I never made it to chair. And on to become the Arizona's national committee woman in 1972. I served as a delegate to the platform in the convention in Miami that year, and also was on the I was a delegate on the platform committee. And then in 1976, I had the privilege of being the secretary of the convention in Kansas City, and called the roll. January of 1977, I was elected co-chair, and a year later was uh, re-elected to that position. And along the way, building the party, uh, I was also very involved in directing a women's program with the RNC. We had uh, conferences and seminars all across the country. We elected women to public office, and one of my proudest moments was to have the year 1977, there were out of 63 women elected to state legislators, 62 were Republican women, and that was not by accident. I worked diligently for the extension of the Equal Rights Amendment. This political journey of mine was filled with conviction, with paradoxes, with idealism and realism, with great disappointments, but lots of rewards and, and lots of fun and wonderful people. But one thing for certain, I felt better about myself and I felt better about my country. My political activism to me also was a, a deep and great educational experience. It also had a, a, a rich and deep moral quality to it. I gained a sense of uh, self-esteem, a sense of my fellow human being, my neighborhood, my community, and my world. I learned lots of lessons, too, in politics, and two that stand out as being profound. One, I learned that in this great democracy that we live in, that individuals can make a difference, and the other was power and the use and abuse of it. I also have a deep and ongoing commitment to women and to women's rights, and I'll never turn my back on these issues. And that's partially why I'm here tonight. 1980 was a dramatic turning point in my life. It was during the presidential campaign, and I was then chairing John Anderson's campaign, traveling the country for John, being a spokesperson, and I heard then the reckless talk, the terrifying talk of a limited nuclear war that was winnable. The nuclear reality struck me as a thunderbolt. It really literally changed my, my, my life. All other issues paled. I began then to try to translate that fear into action. And you saw Betty Bumpers tonight. I joined the Peace, Peace Links and was a panelist for, for Betty. 
even went to Arkansas to speak at the state capitol, got involved in the freeze and got involved in the Committee for National Security and the Women's Leadership Conference. I knew nothing about defense and national security issues, but what I did know was about politics and I did know that I could make a difference. And today I believe that our nation's security is the most compelling issue of our times. It transcends all other issues. It's not a partisan issue. It's not Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, but it is a highly charged political issue. And because of this commitment to peace and national security, I do devote the major part of my time to business executives for national security as a senior advisor, and probably more important, do direct uh, the political program. And I've been at Benz uh, for about four years. And for me, this organization is my opportunity to make a difference. It is my investment in my own future and the future of my children and my grandchildren. It is an opportunity to reshape the definition of national security and hopefully to have public policy that will re reflect that change. Benz is the only business organization that I know of where business women and professional women can work together with their male counterparts on this very critical issue. I believe that women have a critical role to play and in the affairs of this great nation. We have a responsibility to be involved in the debate and to shaping decisions that are central to our well-being and our very lives. As women, we have a powerful contribution to make, and we do have a different voice. We have a unique perspective and style. And I think we offer uh, an extra dimension, perhaps, and sometimes it's ill-defined, but I believe we have a greater sensitivity on human issues and also a greater sensitivity of how government really ought to work. We also offer our rich experience, our thinking, our values, and certainly our beliefs. And I'd like to read to you what the Honorable Jean Kirkpatrick said, the former ambassador to the United Nations, and she said it this way, I was the only woman in our history, I think, who ever sat in regularly at top-level foreign policy-making meetings. Those areas have always been closed to women, not only here, but in most other countries. And it matters a great deal. It's terribly important, maybe even to the future of the world, for women to take a part in making the decisions that shape our destiny. I believe we have to ask ourselves the question, what kind of a society do we want for ourselves, our children, and our families? And what are we willing to do to get to get it. Caring and concerning and being concerned about peace and national security is not good enough. We must get involved. And I look around this room and I see a lot of power and I see power in each and every one of you. And collectively, we have enormous power. We have the outcome of the 1988 elections in our hands. Who's going to be the next president? And what kind of a Congress are we going to have? And will the new government in 1989 advance the goals of peace? In conclusion, the complacency in this country would be a betrayal to our, national, uh, to our, our nation's history. And I'd like to quote to you Ellen Goodman's uh, profound words about this. And Ellen said, it isn't a question of gender and gaps, of motherhood and morality. It isn't a question of men versus women, but of citizens who do and don't participate. At the core, the arms debate isn't a matter of statistics, but of values and choices. And that's a language that anybody can learn. And my final word, and this is a woman I admire greatly, and this is the Honorable Barbara Jordan, the former Congresswoman from Texas, and she expressed her concern in this powerful statement. She said, the stakes, the stakes are too high for government to be a spectator sport. Thank you, Mary. 
Our final panelist, Barry Boyer, grew up in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. Beaver Dam's major claim to fame are that it's the home of both Fred McMurray and whipped cream cheese. In the early 60s, Beaver Dam was named Small Town USA by Life magazine. It was also in the early 60s that Barry accompanied her mother on a trip to Washington, D.C. The governor had asked Barry's mother to attend a conference there on the status of women. And while they were in Washington, Barry's mother got together informally in the hotel with 27 other women attending the conference. They decided to start an organization which they named the National Organization for Women, NOW. Upon returning to Beaver Dam, Barry's mother proceeded to install a Xerox machine in the kitchen. And over the next several years, Barry literally watched the woman move, woman's movement grow in her kitchen, as did other little girls whose mothers had similar kitchens throughout the country. <laughs> you might say that Beaver Dam, along with hundreds of other small town USAs across the country, became the home of the women's movement. Barry later moved from Beaver Dam to the east where she attained both her bachelor's degree and her bachelor from Cornell. She went on to law school here at Harvard. After five years of practicing law and seven years of owning and operating a real estate brokerage and development company, along with having two children, she decided to sell her business and focus full time on working in the Beyond War movement. This year she is a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. Barry. Well, they say that you should um, never ex serve an experimental menu t when company comes, and uh, tonight I was going to try an experiment. For those of you who are here at the Kennedy School and took Ron Heifetz's course, you know that he teaches the idea of the audience and the environment around you are supposed to inspire you to say something. So I, I was going to go cold turkey and not prepare anything to say, and I panicked at the last minute and scribbled a couple of notes on an envelope, which reminded me of my first uh, million dollar real estate deal started out on the back of an envelope. <laughs> anyway, uh, looking around this room, and I see uh, some familiar faces and, and some new faces, the one thing that I, I would really like to leave as a message with everybody here tonight, and the reason I'm here tonight, is that I love this work. I absolutely love this work. It's, um, it's the most meaningful thing I've ever done in my life. To go back a little bit from where I started on this uh, about four or five years ago, five, six years ago, I frankly was walking around in a state of despair, secret despair, about the future, about whether my children would live out their full lives. And really, I didn't believe it would happen. And then I went to, uh, I'm Jewish, I went to high holiday services at our temple, and the rabbi gave two sermons that uh, year that were very, very um, interesting to me. Uh, the first one talked about Nazi Germany and, and what happened there and how it might have been prevented and people not speaking up. And I went home that night and I looked in the mirror and I said, gee, I'd, I'd like to believe that if I'd been living in Germany in the 40s, late 30s, that I would have done everything I could to prevent what happened. But I don't know if I can, I can really look in the mirror and say that. And gee, this nuclear thing is around and I'm looking in the mirror and what am I doing to make sure that it doesn't happen? And then the next day at High Holiday Services, the rabbi gave another sermon in which he talked about uh, Alfred Nobel. And I don't know how many of you have heard this story, but Alfred Nobel was in the business of um, producing munitions. And at one point in time, for some reason, a reporter in Sweden uh, mistakenly learned that uh, Mr. Nobel had died and wrote up an obituary. And Mr. No Nobel opened the newspaper the next morning and saw his obituary. And um, he read it, and it talked about how he had been a munitions manufacturer. And he said, my God, what is my life adding up to? I have another chance here. I want my life to add up in a different way. So he uh, established the Nobel Peace Prize, and that's what we remember him for today. So between these two sermons, and you know, I was keeping going to my real estate business every day and uh, thinking, gosh, how, you know, I'm looking in the mirror, and what am I doing, and how's my life adding up, and feeling really more and more like a prostitute, going through the motions, making money, not enjoying what I was doing, and knowing that there was something more out there that I needed to be doing. 
And around the same time, I went to my uh, first Beyond War introductory evening and started to find out about what the movement was doing and thinking, my gosh, there is something I can do here. So over the next two years, I got more and more involved and uh, it's a grassroots educational movement and we it's just been fantastic. It's made me a better person in every way and I feel like I have a new lease on life. I wake up in the morning and I look in the mirror and I say, what am I going to do today to move this world one step closer to a world beyond war and one step farther from the abyss? And it's definitely made me a better parent. My kids feel hope. They feel that I care. Uh, their friends love to come over and talk about it, and they say, gee, we wish our mom was doing something like this. It's, um, it's been fantastic. So what are the kind of things that an individual can do? Well, Beyond War um, did, a, did us a favor, and they actually printed up 365 little cards, so every morning you can just go, what am I going to do today? There's a couple ideas. Of course, you don't have to be limited to the ideas. You can get creative, get together with friends. You meet wonderful people in this work. You meet committed people. You meet creative people. Um, it's been a fantastic experience. Um, next time you read an op-ed article that you agree with about the issue, uh, write a letter to the editor yourself. Purchase and hang a photo of the Earth in your home to remind you and your family of the interrelatedness of our fragile planet. Call the White House. Give the president your opinion. <laughs> Start clipping newspaper articles and magazine articles and get together with friends and just talk about what are the tough issues we have to face today and what are we going to do about it. Give your child an experience of cultural diversity through music, food, visit to a different place, write a letter to an editor, express your opinion to your congressman, learn more about SDI, the list goes on and on. The idea, of course, is each individual makes a difference. So I came to the Kennedy School this year thinking, well, I'm going to really maximize my effectiveness in this thing. I'm going to learn from the experts how to do this. And I came here, and I've learned a lot this year. <laughs> I really have. But I, I've learned two very important lessons. There are no experts. We're all on the front lines in this thing. We've never faced this kind of crisis before, so there are no experts. And number two, there are no shortcuts. The way that ideas move through society is one individual at a time making a decision, making a decision to act. So even if it's just wearing this little pin of the earth every day, so everybody who sees me is reminded what a little planet we have, I'm making a difference. So I invite you all to join us in our efforts. People at this school will say, oh, this is so unrealistic. This is so naive. I sound naive, right, Beaverdam, Wisconsin? I mean, how naive can you get? And I'll tell you what the answer to that is. You know what's naive is to think that we can continue to do nothing and survive. Thank you. Now it's your turn. So there's a microphone here. And Sue, is there another one up there? One right here. So who would like to speak? Uh, a question, something you want to say? We ask you to limit it to a minute. Do um, you want to stand up, come to the microphone so everybody can hear you? Um, I'd like to ask um, Wand how your program has changed over the past few years, uh, because I think the focus has changed, and why. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. Yes, one's programs have changed. They were originally, I think, more educationally oriented, and there has become, um, you know, since, especially since 1980, with the freeze, the call to halt for the freeze, a much more broad awakening in our country. So WAND has turned much more politically to um, intensified electoral activities, to continued skill trainings, particularly in organizational speakers training and political areas, to campaign work and involvement in the campaigns, to um, 
legislative action alerts to really make a difference throughout the country as I spoke of earlier in terms of uh, people approaching their congressional people. And then that feeds back to the Washington scene with decisions that are made on by those people as they vote for different appropriations and military budgets. And of course by direct lobbying, we're doing a lot more of direct lobbying right on Capitol Hill through our national office in Washington. And we believe that working through the democratic system, it's a good system and, and we're not all utilizing it. You know Reagan was voted into power in 1980 by 26% of the people who could vote. Well, we're not turning out the vote enough, we're, we're not doing enough within our own democracy to make it work and turn things around. Thank you. Our next, the invitation is for questions to the panel or to make a statement yourself about something that is dear to your heart in connection with this issue. Yes? Uh, I want to speak because I think this is a wonderful opportunity to address the Advertising Club. Could you give us your name? My name is Marion Billings and I've been working uh, for years and years, back in the days when we turned out our literature by mimeograph, hand propelled, in the basement of a church. Um, I feel that, in the first place, we have not addressed the question of what we are fighting about. I think that I also feel that we need many more people, different kinds of people, in this in this effort and that we are not getting to the many kinds of people who pour into the polls in Central Square and Union Square and Davis Square last Tuesday. Our literature is aimed at each other. We talk to each other. I would like to see the, the 200 groups in the Boston area working for peace collaborating on advertising in the media that people read, not the kind of newsletters that we put out that don't get to the people we want to reach. And I appeal to the advertising club, some easy, quick, understandable issues. This would be especially effective now while people are working on their income tax. <laughs> and. I think if we all got together, we could do this, put ads in the papers. If we can't afford the Boston Globe, the Boston Herald, put them in small town papers where the rates are low and people do read their small town papers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> to not I welcome what you said. I'm here at tonight. I am executive director of the Advertising Club. We do have public service campaigns twice a year. We entertain applications for such. So, Marion, if you have a client, you're willing to organize the 200 people, I'm more than willing to give you an application to apply. I hear you. They need to be organized, and I can give you entree to the advertising. It's on. It should be back. Hello? Oh. Yeah. Um, a little bit of a word about advertising. This, uh, this last year, Beyond War decided to do an experiment with advertising, and we raised $200,000 for a media campaign in Iowa and, and New Hampshire, the two eyes of, of the needle in the political process. And the ads were big ads showing the pictures of all the candidates and encouraging the voters when they go to the to the various meet the candidates nights or in that living rooms to ask the candidates questions about what they were going to do to get us mm -hmm. beyond this crisis and um, I think the uh, the campaign must have been somewhat effective a friend of mine from Iowa called and said geez everybody's asking all these questions out here all of a sudden this and that we're seeing the ads and then uh, just before the New Hampshire primary the night before I don't know how many of you saw the um, they had a meet the candidate night at the uh, mall uh, the Nashville Mall or Manchester Mall or something like that and uh, Jesse Jackson was up there just using totally beyond war rhetoric. I couldn't believe it. So advertising does pay. Good. No. <laughs> Benefit of my being here tonight. Um, another question. Your, would you give your name please? Oh, okay. You. My name is Yoshiko Tomioka. Uh, I'm a journalist from Japan. Um, I have a question to anybody there. Um, for instance, um, the bans and the men's ad says 
Benz and Beza take a non-ideological approach to America's security. And the, on the other pamphlet, you say uh, real national security should be everybody's business. Why not international security? Well, I'll, I'll take that on. When Benz talks about uh, securing America's future and making it safer, uh, we believe that that extends beyond our borders because of our own leadership in the world and that if we can secure our nation and, and then, it, as I say, it will expand beyond that. And Ben's in our approach does not really deal with foreign policy issues. We don't take, have a detailed uh, defense uh, plan either. So that's primarily it. Our focus is, is more narrow. but. We certainly don't operate in a vacuum. Uh, we understand that the problems uh, extend beyond our borders. Does that answer your question? Uh, we are, Japan is, as you know, the only country which has um, which experienced the nu nuclear holocaust um, in 1945, two, two bombs dropped on Japan on two cities. And um, because of the very close relationship with the United States, our U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, our American people, American government, are forced, uh, has been forcing Japan to increase the, uh, the, the military budget. And uh, we, we don't have the, the military forces, but we have actually, because our constitution uh, does not allow our, the possession of the, the, our the military forces. But actually, because of the relationship with, with the United States, we, we, we are increasing the military budget, which we don't like. So I think it, when you talk about national security, but the, then the United States actually intervene the ad, other countries. That, that's my point. And well, I think your well, point is, yeah. go ahead. Well, I, I think that... Um, now, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not uh, criticizing that because... No, no, I understand uh, that, but I think also that, that uh, one, of, one of the views that, that comes into play with that is that, uh, as you well know, Japan is a uh, better financial uh, status than America has at this point in time. And because we are concerned about a sort of two-tier economic system in this country, in which we are devoting such an enormous amount of our assets and resources to the military, rather than to the strengthening our economy that I have tried to address in some of my remarks. I think that there are people who have felt that the need to sort of protect democratic principles around the world has to be shared. In other words, the support of troops, NATO troops, and the support of the military in general. Again, that gets back to Ben's tough question, which is, what is national security? I mean, how much security do we need to feel secure? How much security does Japan need to feel secure? And, and we don't think we're answering it in the United States. And I think that reflects itself on our foreign policy. Are you complete with that question? Yes. Yes, I understand yes. Uh, what you mean. My, my point is that um, at least we women must uh, seek for the world peace mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. beyond, regardless of the yes. uh, political ideologies or whatever. That was my point. Yes. And, and, uh, I don't think you yeah. have any disagreement. No, no not at all. <clears throat> yes. Yes, I'm Elizabeth Sherman. I'm the Associate Director of Women in Politics at Boston College. I'd like to address um, my question to Mrs. Hughes and also to Mrs. Crisp if, and other people who would like to answer it. Um, and that has to do with the issue that was brought out very clearly in the film, and that is the profitability of the arms race. And um, as we are defining national security as far more than, than weaponry to protect us in war, I'd like to know exactly what you might say to proposals that have to do with economic conversion and to what extent you think it is possible to address the problems that are associated with some of the large defense contractors in this country who employ hundreds of thousands of workers. Um, you might be aware that 
the Quincy Shipyard closed, which was dependent upon defense dollars, and the General Electric Munitions Plant in Lynn is threatened with layoffs. And a lot of these workers will not be employed, and I'm wondering how you think this addiction to dependence upon the Pentagon can be broken, since the profitability issue is really uh, a key one, I think, in the arms race. Well, I, I think on one hand, the uh, we're going to see more um, investment by foreign com uh, companies in America in our heavy, in our what we call our Rust Belt industries that are quickly rusting away and have rusted away, and perhaps even in our, we're, we're just going to see a lot more foreign money coming into the United States bar buying into our industrial complex here. And uh, I think that, you know, to address uh, economic conversion, uh, Ben's as an organization hasn't taken a position on that. I would say that one thing we did find out in an economic study that Ben's uh, was given a grant to, to do, we discovered that economic conversion is not really a working. The fallout of defense R&D into the private sector is, very, is, is less than it used to be. So, so we have some real problems that we have to address in terms of all the things that people like Felix Rohayden and Pete Peterson and all these other business leaders are talking about, which is that, you know, we, we are going to have to get a business plan to start running this country. And we are going to have to prioritize where we're going to spend our bucks. And what Benz is really saying is that we have to manage our defense for better results. We, if, we have to have a plan to know why we're buying what we're buying and why we're investing in what we're investing and is that giving us the security that quote we think we need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I just would add something. I think we're missing something about Benz here because Benz represents mainstream business in this country and is trying to counter the military industrial complex. And one of the exciting things for me is to see how we are reaching out and using the political system effectively. We have met, first of all, I'll just say very quickly, Benz defines national security uh, in the philosophy of Eisenhower, who said, no matter how much you spend on arms alone, there is no safety in arms. The total product, security is a total product of a strong economy, strong institutions, strong people, as well as a strong defense. And that's where we come from. We take a very pragmatic approach uh, to uh, the economy and, and to all of these issues of security. And as we reach the, the uh, we've met with almost every presidential candidate, our Benz executives have. We provided, we're not a PAC, we don't give money, but we do give our expertise on the issues. And we're now targeting about 70, 80 congressional and senatorial campaigns. And we meet, sit down with the candidates to try to impart this new kind of thinking on national security. May I also address the question a little okay. bit? Okay. Um, no, go ahead. Uh, I think some of the questions here are quite interrelated in, in terms of women and and recognizing um, a women's peace. This past summer I was in the Soviet Union to the World Congress of Women with over 3,000 women from 154, I'm sorry, 154 nations and their questions to us as the United States delegation was, why aren't you there working in your own country to stop your arms race? So I think that's what you're going to find about a lot of the groups in our country is that they're really trying to work within the United States to stop what's happening here. And of course, we care very deeply about the women and the people all over the planet. And in terms of the issue of economic conversion and military spending, what we have to look at is this is an incredibly intricate and complex situation with the milita military industrial complex. You take any weapon system such as the B-1 bomber and these companies have made sure that its distribution crosses 30 or 40 states so that it's really tough to stop these weapon systems. And the money involved is way beyond our imagination. The Department of Defense spends a billion dollars a working day on the military. And that boils down to $2 million a minute, folks. 
And that's a heck of a lot more than you or I, many of us, will see in our lifetime, let alone the, what its effects of that small amount, two million a minute, two million dollars, will go a long ways to programs in terms of our, the fabric of our society for education, health, welfare, housing, uh, any number of things, social security benefits, the growing population of the old. So it's, it's a really tough prog program, and there are groups focusing on economic conversion, and um, as Mary and Susan have said, you know, like Benz and Wand and many other groups, we're looking very closely at the effect of the economics of not just the nuclear arms race, because that's a small part of the military budget. You know, the military budget is into the Department of Energy. It's into very many aspects of departments across our judicial board, and we need to be looking at that and see how it affects us and work all together, and it's going to be just tremendous changes that are needed and a good place to start indeed is with the business people as well as with very every individual grassroots person who can make a difference through your own personal investment you know when you go to a bank or when you invest your money look into some of the social conscious investments as an individual there's many many little things that each of us can do thanks Beth. Barry uh, yeah so I don't know who here is taking Bob Reich's course I am it's uh, talking about declining industries, newly emerging industries, and the bottom line that, according to Professor Reich about our economic problems here in this country, is that we just not have, have not come to, the, to face the fact, the realization, that we now live in a world market, an international marketplace. Technology and communication have made this a small world, and we're part of it. It's the same kind of realization that we haven't come to regarding what is national security. The fact of the matter is, in the nuclear age, national security and international security are synonymous. There's no difference. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is educate ourselves about those things and start thinking in terms of survival. Dar Darwin talked about survival of the fittest. We used to think about survival of the fittest, meaning survival of the most powerful or the strongest. That's not how Darwin meant it, and that's not how it is anymore. Survival of the fittest is that who fits in best into the whole. And that's we have to, how we have to start thinking economically. It's how, how we have to start thinking security-wise. Time for one more question. Your name? Uh, my name is Jan Eagle, and I appreciate the question that you asked because it is the stopping point almost every time I've ever tried to discuss this issue with people. I'm also a member of the uh, Beyond War movement. In, on Mother's Day, I was in, at the, test site, the nuclear test site in Nevada uh, protesting the testing of those uh, weapons. And as we walked down the, down the road with the Shoshones whose land we were on welcoming us and protesters on both sides, the men who worked um, in construction and who worked on that base lined the road to the right, and as we came to the road to step across the cattle guard to be arrested, they yelled at us, don't you care about our country? And I saw that in order to speak to the issue, I, what I needed to do personally was to learn a great deal more about it in order to address that question. And um, I, at that moment, decided that it was time for me to stop having a private life. And so I left teaching English. I am also registered at the Kennedy School and in the Education Graduate School. And I want to recommend to you two books that have made a big difference for me in talking with people. Robert Reich, um, a book called Tales of a New America. And he delineates in a very simple book the four myths by which we have been living, which no longer work. Um, and the other book is also Robert Reich and it's the next American frontier. It's, he talks about how we get from the economies in which we have been living to those in which we do not suffer from what Norman Cousins called the pathology of power. <coughs> and Norman Cousins' book is also about how to get from the addictive war culture you know, to a peace culture. What are the four myths? The, the four myths are that, one of, the first one is the rot at the top, that whoever's in politics whoever's in charge of anything is corrupt. That we've moved beyond that time now, we each of us need to be a person who takes responsibility. Um, the second is the, the mob at the gate, that we can put up a barrier from, uh, against the world, that we can keep people out and that we need to keep people out. That's no longer true. And the third is the benevolent community, that we are taking care of each other. We're not. 
And the fourth uh, is the rugged individualist, the Lone Ranger, that it's possible anymore to be an individual, to work as the Lone Ranger. We can't, we must work together. The rod at the top, yeah. So the, one of the women's groups put out a poster that I had on my classroom door uh, for a number of years. It made the reserve officers in my school furious. Um, it showed children climbing on a jungle gym, and it said, it'll be a fine day when the schools have all the money they need and the Air Force has to hold a bake sale to buy a bomber. <laughs> the last question but be, you have something to say you want to do it quickly sorry I thought Elizabeth said that it was so, all right um, anyway um, I'm Susan Lees I work with the Women's Peace Initiative which is a loose network of women in Massachusetts that have been uh, working to unite women uh, have the vision of uniting women widely around a shared peace agenda and we've recently put together a women's peace platform USA 1988 which I'm going to leave over on the table here with information about how to get in touch with us join us everyone is welcome men women and um, thank you all thank it's you a great evening. thank you so it's time to close the evening and we'd like to close it in the following way would you please stay for just a minute and share with the person next to you what most inspired you about this evening what you're moved to do personally, if you're moved to do something with your time or your money. And then on your way out, there's literature over here on the side, anyone that wants to pick up a brochure about any of the things mentioned tonight. And the panelists will be around to talk. So please take a minute just to talk to someone before you leave. And thank you very much for coming.